Have a great episode for you today. I received an email from someone from Wisconsin who captured something very incredible on his trail cam. But before we get to the stories, I want to thank today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan. When selecting an injury law firm, size matters. Let me introduce you to Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Boasting over 100 offices nationwide and a robust team of 900 lawyers, and growing, they possess the resources necessary to secure the best possible outcomes for their clients. With the capacity to invest millions in a case, Morgan & Morgan is well equipped to handle a diverse range of personal injury cases, including car accidents, slip and fall incidents, workplace injuries, medical malpractice, nursing home abuse, and defective product claims. Unlike firms that operate on a one-lawyer-fits-all model, Morgan & Morgan has attorneys who specialize in every area of personal injury law. This specialization ensures that you'll be matched with a lawyer who has a deep understanding of the specific legal landscape relevant to your case. Moreover, Morgan & Morgan operates on a contingency fee basis, meaning you won't incur any charges unless they win your case. There are no upfront costs, sign-up fees, or charges for calls, investigations, meetings, or the time and effort dedicated to your case. This client-centric approach has led to a remarkable recovery of over $13 billion for their clients. With a trust base of over 3 million people, many choose to call Morgan & Morgan in their time of need. Their impressive support infrastructure includes over 4,000 staff members available 24-7 to address your case questions or concerns. Initiating the process is straightforward. Click the link in my description, visit fourthpeople.com slash Donovan, or dial pound law from your cell phone. And don't forget to mention Donovan sent you. I've got to share something that happened to me in Wisconsin, where life is pretty calm most of the time, surrounded by cornfields and cows. But a few months ago, things took an unexpected turn. It all began on a freezing winter night when I heard these strange clicking sounds in my backyard. My first thought was a raccoon or something similar, but this was different, rhythmic, consistent, and unlike any animal I'd ever heard. Not one to let things slide, I decided to investigate. I ordered a trail camera online, one of those weatherproof models with good night vision and high resolution images, perfect for capturing wildlife or keeping an eye on your property. Setting it up on a nearby oak tree, I hoped it would provide some clarity. I patiently waited, days turning into nights as winter deepened and the snow blanketed everything. The anticipation gnawed at me, but I resisted the urge to check the footage prematurely. Then, those eerie clicking sounds returned, closer and more unsettling than before. The rhythmic clicks echoed in the silence, like a clock ticking in the night. I could feel the cold biting through my jacket. Late at night, the camera detected movement, breaking the quiet of the snowy yard. What I saw was unsettling, an unusually pale figure moving in a bizarre, unnatural manner. Its face seemed to stretch into a gaping mouth, with two large, black, ominously gleaming eyes. Donovan, whatever that thing was, it wasn't a raccoon or a kid from the neighborhood. Watching the footage, fear gripped me. I hit pause and studied that still frame the strange, mismatched limbs against the snowy backdrop. Attached to this email, you'll find the image captured by the trail camera. I can't explain it, but maybe you can make sense of this eerie sighting. My backyard, where I'd spent countless peaceful moments, no longer felt safe. You see, Donovan, this town is my home, and the thought of such a creature nearby filled me with profound terror. But what could I do with this information? I couldn't just call the authorities. I had no concrete evidence, just a blurry image that could easily be dismissed. So I did my best, staying vigilant at night, listening for any signs of disturbance, and treading cautiously in my yard during the day. Winter gradually gave way to spring, and the snow melted, but the clicking sound remained, albeit more subdued. That's when I stumbled upon stories about the crawler, and despite the fear, Sharing my experience feels strangely therapeutic. Your friend from Wisconsin.
That night in San Diego remains vivid in my memory. Training for a marathon requires an intense level of dedication, and that's what I was in the midst of when this happened. It's not just the physical strain you put yourself through, it's the mental strain too. Whether it was the challenge of endurance or confronting personal struggles, I found myself happily distracted by the intensity. There was something calming about it, the quiet, the solitude. It helped to focus on the rhythm of my feet hitting the pavement. Each footfall echoed off the park structures. I often ran through the trail near the Japanese friendship garden with its manicured bushes and hidden koi pond. With each beat, my breath became a low hum and I could feel my heart pounding from the exertion. I was pushing personal boundaries, making peace with the pain, the fatigue, and the sweat that was liberally streaming down my face. My focus was on the path ahead. The glow of the lamplight in the distance that was shimmering off the wet grass was both my guiding light and my finish line. But this time around, something was off. Things were not looking like they usually did. Something had disturbed me that night, a rustle not far off from the path. At first, I thought it was probably a wild animal, a raccoon maybe. But then an intense smell of sulfur hit me. I stopped dead mid-stride. That is how horrible it was. Even the sweat cooling on my skin didn't smell half as bad. The overpowering mix of sulfur and something undefinable made me choke. Before I knew it, there was a rustling again, but much closer this time. I remember squinting, peering into the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest. At this point, I couldn't have told you if it was pounding from exertion or from fear. I was no stranger to the park, but something felt wrong. Something felt unnerving. The day had completely changed, and it was now no longer just a run in the park. I remember the freezing dread creeping into me as I spotted an odd shape against the backdrop of the lunar glow. It was huge, standing on two hocked legs, its silhouette unnatural and rigid in the moonlight. My heart continued to pound as I strained to discern the figure in the darkness. I could see the dark outline of monstrous wings, folded eerily against the thing's body, like a twisted take on some mythical beast. Its head was strange, unnatural, straight out of a horror story. The air thickened with tension, and goosebumps formed on my skin. The encounter had just begun. Above the canopy of trees, a figure swooped and dived, snatching bats on the fly. With growing dread, I watched the bizarre scene in the sky. The creature seemed demonic. It was ghastly and terrifying. Its silhouette against the moonlight showed a winged beast, like a dragon with a goat's head. Its skeletal exterior and strange glowing yellow eyes seemed to burn intensely against the pale glow of the stars. It reminded me of goblin tales from my childhood. The sight filled me with primal fear. I was amidst the peace and solitude of the park. But with that grotesque sight in the sky, it seemed like I had walked into a twisted, nightmarish dimension. Yet, I found myself unable to move, paralyzed by a mix of fear and fascination. The peaceful Balboa Park contrasted sharply with the terror in the sky. My once peaceful run now felt like a scene from a Stephen King novel. As the creature completed another terrifying swoop, I snapped back to reality. I could cut my run short or let fear push me faster. Gathering my wits, I chose the latter, my racing thoughts drowned by the pounding of my sneakers on the pavement. As I finished my run, with the park's lamp glow serving as the finish line, my thoughts returned to the graphic sight. What I'd seen began to sink in. The smell of sulfur still steered my senses, and the eerie memory of that unnaturally weird creature loomed large in my thoughts. I had pushed my limits tonight, only it was not as I had planned. I had pushed past what I thought was possible. Would I be able to return to this trail without the image of that beast haunting me? Was I willing to let one run in with the alleged Jersey Devil derail my training? Time would tell. Right now, the only thing that seemed more dominant than the smell of sulfur was the burning curiosity to find the truth about what I had witnessed. I reached home, feeling an unsettling blend of the surreal and the familiar. I realized my training had taken on a new dimension now. Encountering the Jersey Devil added a thrilling mystery to my otherwise mundane runs. The line between fear and fascination, it seems, 
is indeed a thin one. I want to share a strange incident that happened in the middle of the summer a few years ago. I was doing this art project in Death Valley National Park in California. Now you might be wondering why anyone would choose Death Valley at the height of summer. But sometimes, the extreme conditions there inspire the best art in me. I've been working on a series of landscapes, trying to capture the unique beauty of the desert, how it comes alive even in the extreme heat. While many see the desert as barren and lifeless, I found beauty in its solitude and resilience. I was deep into the park, camping out near the dunes. I had been there for a handful of days, painting day and night. I was so engrossed in my painting that I lost track of time, often forgetting to eat or sleep. On what must have been the third or fourth day, the desert heat was brutal, even for Death Valley. Couldn't breathe properly, and each swallow of water seemed to evaporate before it went down. But like the time passing by unnoticed, even the discomfort seemed irrelevant compared to my work. But on that particular afternoon, things shifted, and it wasn't just the weather playing tricks on me. I felt watched. Normally, I would have brushed it off as just being alone in the desert and it playing tricks on my mind. But this time, I stopped painting and looked around. There wasn't another soul for miles, I was pretty sure of that. I tried to focus back on my art, but the feeling persisted, growing even more intense. My heartbeat quickened, and despite myself, I was scared, but there was a part of me that wanted to know more. I felt that something unusual was about to happen. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. At first, I thought it was the heat haze, causing the air to shimmer and play tricks on my vision, a common desert phenomenon. But as I squinted and peered, I realized it was something else. Something in the area was moving against the static backdrop of the sand dunes, barely perceptible, like a smudge against a pristine canvas. At a distance, there were markings in the sand, too intricate to have been caused by the wind. They weren't footprints or tire tracks, but more like symbols, motifs even. That's when I sensed for sure that something was there with me, something bizarre. And for the first time over those past few days, I left my canvas and paints behind and walked towards the peculiarity. The markings in the sand held an eerie feel to them, like hieroglyphs conveying an unspoken message. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I left my camp, heading deeper into the desert to investigate something that I couldn't make sense of. And yet, there I was, feet crunching in the hot sand, heartbeat thrumming in my ears, sweat trickling down my face, walking towards the unknown. As I moved closer, the feelings of dread and curiosity both heightened. In the vast desert, I saw it, or him, or, well, the damn thing wasn't even human. I can tell you that much. It looked to be around seven feet tall, massive, bulky in its form, with a primal, lumbering grace. Its back was turned towards me, the creature seemingly engrossed in whatever it was drawing in the sand. It was almost as if it was from a movie. The creature was terrifying yet captivating, standing upright with a clear, ancient aura about it. It bore a scaly, reptilian skin that glinted against the harsh sunlight. I could see the large, black claws on its hands, etching intricate symbols into the sand, the power and precision of them strangely mesmerizing. I was too far away to see the eyes, but I could clearly make out the dinosaur-ish, lizard-like head. A terrifying prospect, but at that moment, a fascinating one. While I was initially terrified, I realized the creature wasn't only horrifying. It was strange, but also held a sort of elegance. The creature was focused on its task, not showing any signs of aggression as it kept to its drawings. Like an artist deeply immersed in creating a masterpiece. A mix of fear, curiosity, awe, and fascination rendered me breathless. Driven by those emotions, I took several steps forward, each step bringing me closer to that extraordinary entity. But I didn't get too far. Before I'd even have the distance between us, the creature turned. It looked at me, its eyes a piercing yellow under the desert sun. My heart pounded against my chest like a wild drum. And then, seeming to pay no further mind to me, it turned back to its drawings. 
Noticing that it didn't plan to harm me, at least not immediately, I probed closer, close enough to make out the intricate patterns it was drawing. They looked like some alien form of art, symbols making sense yet being nonsensical at the same time. I dared not disturb it, fearing it might take offense. So beating back my adrenaline-fueled impulse to run, I stood there watching for a while before retreating, leaving the creature to its work. Returning to my camp, my previous work seemed insignificant compared to the mystery I'd just witnessed. My perspective on life and reality shifted dramatically after that encounter. The encounter with the creature deeply influenced my art and life going forward, introducing a touch of the bizarre and unexplainable to my work. Since that encounter, the world has been a bigger place. The desert, the vast, barren landscape holds more secrets than anyone could fathom. It was cold December that year, and this particular day was heavy coat weather, but I'd finally managed to take some time away to take the solo hiking trip I'd been dreaming of. As an avid winter hiker, I'd long marked Acadia National Park in Maine as a winter destination. To me, winter hiking beat the pain of swatting bugs and sweating like crazy under the hot sun. I craved the crisp air that seemed to sharpen your senses, the profound silence, the crunch of fresh snow, and the beauty of the mountains. It felt like entering a different world. So, I made my way to Acadia. Setting up the camp was easy enough, my tent looking like a tiny little dot in the sea of white. I immediately felt how isolating it was out there. I was alone all right, which I actually loved. The days fell into a rhythmic routine. Each morning I woke at dawn, feeling the cold as I made breakfast. Then I'd head out with the crunching snow under my boots being the only sound breaking the stillness. I lost myself in that cycle for the days following, returning to my tent late each night. I was tired but energized by the day's adventures. It all felt perfectly normal, right until it didn't. It's still pretty fresh in my mind, and I vividly remember how the atmosphere changed in a way that I still struggle to explain. One particular day, I found myself in one of the more forested areas of the park. It was during those moments that I first felt it. I couldn't shake an eerie sense of being watched, and a strange damp odor of decay hung in the air, clinging to my nostrils and unsettling my stomach, a smell like death. I shrugged it off as nothing initially, but as the glow of the winter sun began to retreat, I felt like I was not alone. I wouldn't say I saw anything, not exactly but I kept catching unsettling movements in the corner of my eye. My tranquil retreat took on a stifling quality, as if my breaths and the crunch of snow beneath my feet were being muffled. An overwhelming dread started to send constant chills through my body. Then I saw something, what looked like an elk's legs moving in the distance. My heart raced as I strained for a better look, but whatever it was remained elusive, concealed by the forest's edge. It was enough for me to consider packing up my gear and rushing back home, but the small foolish part of me decided to stay, thinking sleep would shake me out of my madness. As my unease grew, I started noticing other anomalies that seemed unnatural. Random footprints in the snow, eerily tall and disproportionately large, leading into the dense forest that disappeared as suddenly as they appeared. Unidentified howls echoed in the biting air at twilight starkly different from the usual sounds of the wilderness I was familiar with. I felt like I was being toyed with, stalked. Images kept flashing before my eyes, quick movements at the edge of my sight line in the dimming light, tall shapes that moved with an eerie elegance, strange dark forms in the woods that seemed to oscillate in and out of my vision. The most terrifying moment was an encounter that defied reality. One evening, as the sun set, I found myself closer than ever to the creature, standing just a stone's throw away from it. Antlers protruded from its skull-like head, a gruesome sight against the picturesque winter backdrop. It stood at least eight feet high, towering over everything nearby. Its eyes, glowing red, seemed to stare right through me, shaking my composure. The creature's appearance was horrifying, emaciated, and barely more than a skeleton. Equally unsettling was the rancid smell, stronger than ever. 
making it almost unbearably nauseating to breathe. Panicked, I started running, clumsily making my way through the snow to put distance between us. I could hear its haunting groan vibrating in the still air as I made my desperate attempt to get back to camp. I stayed up all night and daylight couldn't come soon enough. As dawn broke, against all odds, I was alive. As I packed up my gear with trembling hands, I found an unsettling respect for the creature, the forest, and the untamed wilderness. That experience has stayed with me, making me more cautious and respectful of nature's hidden aspects. It's a reminder that there's much we don't understand, and sometimes it's better to keep it that way. So, it was the summer of 2015, and I was lucky enough to land a fieldwork assignment at Arches National Park in Utah. I'm a geologist, and I've always been fascinated by unique rock formations. When it comes to that, Utah's a treasure trove. I was thrilled for the opportunity to study these stunning natural sculptures firsthand. My focus was on Delicate Arch, the poster child of Utah. You know the one because its image is everywhere, and you might have even seen this beautiful structure on Utah license plates. Anyway, it was a bright, clear morning, the kind of day that makes those massive structures look like they've been painted against the sky. I was out there in the park, surrounded by breathtaking sights everywhere I looked. The landscape was surreal and captivated me. I had my backpack full of tools and a notebook for all the things I'd find and jot down details of. For the first few hours, everything was as usual. I was happily chipping bits off rocks, collecting samples, jotting stuff down, and taking pictures for later referencing. I was so absorbed in my work that I lost track of time. As the sun began its descent to the west, I was struck by an out-of-place odor, a potent mixture of deep earth, rotting garbage, and sulfur. It wasn't at all common for the area, as anyone who's been in the middle of a desert would know. It's stone and dust, not a garbage dump. Yet it was there, strong and pungent, and I wondered whether some poor animal had died nearby. I quickly forgot about it and moved to another section of the site. However, the bad smell seemed to follow me. Each time I moved locations, it lingered. It was bizarre, unexpected, and unnerving. It felt off. As twilight fell, casting long shadows that distorted the landscape, I knew it was time to end my day's work. But just as I was about to pack up my gear, I heard a soft rustling behind me. Thinking it was a small critter or a bird, I turned around, my gaze falling on a mound of rocks not too far off. The mound was shrouded in the falling dusk. Shadows were adding a layer of ambiguity to its shape. Humoring my curiosity, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it in the general direction of the noise, squinting to make out the shape. As the flashlight beam danced over the stones, I saw something that looked oddly reflective almost like shiny metal, something that obviously didn't belong in a mound of earth-toned rocks. I remember freezing in place for a moment, the light beam held steady on that metallic glint. Had someone lost something, or was it left by some careless tourists? The sun had begun to dip behind the horizon, and with the ever-increasing darkness, my instincts warred within me. Part of me was curious enough to investigate, but I was also aware of how late it was getting. That's when I noticed movement, something small and strange, a shadow within the mound. It was barely visible, but it was enough to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. It's hard to put it down in words, that sensation of something being off, of normality taking a sharp left turn. But in that transition from dusk to night, a wave of unease washed over me. I hoped it was just an animal or a trick of the fading light. It was something that was about to turn my quiet evening in the Utah desert into a story that I'd remember forever. I was unaware that this was merely the beginning of my encounter with the inexplicable. I was about to investigate it when a low hum filled the air. It was a deep, pulsating vibration that seemed to resonate from all sides. I barely had time to react when I saw a faint glow hovering above the horizon. It soon flared into a bright light that moved fast and soon ballooned in size, and it now looked like a fireball moving towards me. I instinctively darted behind the largest boulder nearby 
and peeked out to see the glowing object touch down. It was now a few hundred yards away from where I was hiding. It was a strange disc-like craft, reflecting the scant twilight and making the surrounding bleak desert surreal. But what captured my attention were the decidedly small figures, about four feet tall, head and shoulders distinct, that emerged from the bottom of the craft. There were about seven or eight of them, with large heads that seemed to bob slightly on their stick-like necks. Their arms were thin, dangling down to their knees. I couldn't help but shudder upon seeing their black oval eyes. Devoid of any pupils or iris, I felt an overwhelming sense of strangeness. Their eyes struck me as emotionless, intimidatingly intelligent, and eerily devoid of any discernible features, like a mouth or nose. The smell was stronger now, the putrid scent of rotting things, and the earthy dampness of a deep cave on a humid day. Fumbling in my bag, I pulled out my binoculars. Through the lenses, I watched these figures. My mind struggled to categorize as anything but beings from another world conducting their field research, much as I had been doing moments before. Their spindly digits moved expertly as they went about what appeared to be soil sampling, silent as ghosts, and methodically collected rock and soil samples from all around. I was so awestruck that my heart pounded loud in my ears while I had completely forgotten about my camera. I felt like I was witnessing a monumental moment, but a thought occurred to me. What if they were territorial? Instinctively, I decided not to further test my luck and kept my camera off. What felt like hours, but must have been just under 40 minutes, as my wristwatch told me later, the beings stopped their activities. One by one, they headed back into the craft. As the last one ascended into the dull silver disc, the humming sound returned, and the craft slowly lifted off and vanished into the night. The sudden silence afterwards felt deafening. Once sure they weren't returning, I quickly gathered my gear. I no longer wanted to camp in the desert. Once I calmed down, I sat staring at the horizon, where I had just seen those otherworldly visitors. Days and weeks passed, but I couldn't forget that evening. I felt like someone who'd seen too much and my thoughts started to mirror conspiracy theories. The emotional turmoil was undeniable. Had I truly encountered alien researchers? Was Earth under extraterrestrial study? I still shiver about it whenever I'm contemplating that thought. So, that was my encounter. As bizarre as it sounds, part of me is hesitant about sharing this story, but people have to know that we might not be alone. I want to share an odd encounter I had a few years back. It was during a mountain biking event I participated in near Park City, Utah. It wasn't a race or anything. There wasn't even a specific path, although a route was marked to help us not get lost. We were just a group of biking fanatics enjoying the mountain. But when opportunity knocks, I often find myself in crazy chaotic situations, especially on a mountain bike. Because the promise of challenging trails in northern Utah well, I couldn't resist. The day of the event, we were blessed with clear skies, and the weather was just warm enough for a comfortable ride. On the trail, time seemed to both slow down and speed up simultaneously. The scenery was breathtaking and challenging as usual. I realized about an hour into the ride that I had veered off the marked trail. Rather than panic, I embraced this as a new exploration. I had a vague sense of unease for maybe half a second before the thought evaporated in favor of, well, this just became an exploration. The farther I rode into the unmarked part of the park, the denser the forest around me became. The chirping birds and rustling underbrush kept me company, a welcome solitude from the event's earlier hustle at the starting line. As I pedaled deeper into the unknown, I noticed something peculiar about the environment. The normal sounds of the forest seemed quieter, suffocated under a palpable tension in the air. It felt as if nature was pausing, anticipating something unknown to me. It was then that I heard a strange clicking noise mixed in with the sounds of the forest. Instinctively, I reduced my speed, my grip tightening on the bicycle handles. It was a sharp, disjointed sound that seemed both alien yet familiar at the same time. I couldn't place it but it didn't fit with the regular in-sync rhythm of the forest. It seemed more personal 
more curious. It's hard to describe, but the sound felt curious, and I felt like how a cat reacts to a new noise, trying to understand. To this day, I can't begin to rationalize what followed. There were no screaming alarms in my head, no electrifying feeling of danger. Instead, a subtle unease crept in, as if something unseen lurked nearby. In that eerie silence of the park, I was unprepared for the universe's next curveball. I had stopped and dismounted to relieve myself behind a tree. My mountain bike was propped against a birch tree in a grove. But that wasn't the strange part. It was the creature studying my bicycle, with an unusual fascination that caught me off guard. At first glance, my mind tried to place it in any familiar category. Four-legged? Yes. Thin and elongated. Absolutely. It was pale, almost blending with the birch trees if not for its curious eyes fixed on my mountain bike. Its body seemed gaunt, stretched out and skulking awkwardly on all fours around my bike. I've heard animal noises in the wild, like when canoeing or hiking alone. But the repeating clicks, the organized rhythm emanating from the creature, was altogether unique, if a little unsettling. Its clicking sounded thoughtful. Mirrored by the curiosity, I could see in its pitch-black eyes as it touched my bike. For some reason, the scene felt more bizarre than terrifying. Was it simply curious about the unfamiliar object that had entered its domain? Was it debating if this hard, shiny contraption was a strange kind of prey? If so, it didn't seem terribly eager to fight it off. Carefully, slowly sidestepping, I maneuvered myself in a less conspicuous spot still keeping the creature in my line of sight. The creature took no notice, still engrossed in my mountain bike. Gathering my courage, I decided on a slow approach towards the bike, eyes set on it, barely daring to breathe. Inch by painstaking inch, I moved closer until I was just a few feet away. Those black eyes then lifted to meet mine, the clicking sound pausing. Seconds passed like lifetimes, and while it was gone, and moved around in a predatory crawl, it didn't feel dangerous in that moment. If anything, it radiated a sense of curiosity. There was a mutual understanding of two foreign creatures, caught in a situation neither would have ever expected. Taking a deep breath, I unclipped the bike, its familiar weight grounding me amidst the strange events. Eyes still locked on the silent creature, I backed away, the tension in the atmosphere finally dissipating. I rode away, leaving the creature in its peaceful habitat. I learned two things that day. First, those mountain biking trail markers were there for a reason. Straying might land you someplace uninvited. Second, we share this planet with far more diverse and awe-inspiring creatures than we could ever believe. The pale, clicking creature became my tale to tell, a testament to the wild and its mysteries. And while it left me a tad more cautious about wandering off during my biking sprees, I can't deny that small part of me that pines for another encounter, another peek into the unseen.